In a crowded, poverty-stricken city in Pakistan, a young girl named Nadia spends her days wandering the streets, begging. Her characteristic features are the reason she is revered by the locals. She is but one of many, known as the Rat Children of Pakistan. This is their story. My loves and welcome to episode 11 of makeup and mayhem true crime with me bella monsoon so right off the get-go i just want to put it out there that this episode is unlike any episode thus far and unlike any episode i ever ever thought i would be doing but that being said i do think that the events that transpire within this episode are incredibly shocking and they deserve for the victims to be shown and known to a wider audience. But first, let me introduce myself. So here it is in a nutshell. I'm a mental health professional who just so happens to be obsessed with makeup, true crime, and the motives that drive people to do what they do. So what that means is that every single True Crime Thursday or Freaky Friday, I post a brand new video that looks at a real life crime from a psychological viewpoint whilst looking at the moments that led up to the crime itself. During these episodes, I also try to share psychological concepts and knowledge that you may or may not be aware of. So just a quick disclaimer, as I mentioned, today's story is very different to my previous stories. It does still contain information on a crime, a crime that was committed to a larger number of people. It still is absolutely horrendous and I do feel like it needs a platform to be spoken about. Today's story contains material citing subject matter of child abuse and medical torture. I mean absolutely no disrespect to the victims nor their family and the purpose of this video is to spread awareness and education about a crime that I feel many are unaware of. As always, this story has been thoroughly researched by myself and includes real life accounts and footage from individuals who are directly involved in this case. So without further ado, on to episode 11. In a crowded area in the poverty-stricken city of Gujarat, Pakistan, not to be confused with the Indian city Gujarat, there was and quite possibly still is, albeit underground, for many years, a horrendous form of child slavery and abuse happening right out in the open. Religious orthodoxy and superstitious beliefs, coupled with mass illiteracy, served to pave the way for the exploitation of one of the most vulnerable populations in society, its children. And you want to know the craziest part? Through all the research I did, the rumors of this ritual abuse spanned back over a hundred years, with the earliest record in the 1800s. So just a side note, Reading journal articles and newspaper articles from the 1800s is kind of a culture shock on its own with the terms imbeciles and idiots being used to describe these children. So that brings me to my next point. I will at times make use of the term rat children. This is not meant to be disrespectful from my side. I am just using this term as it is to maintain the authentic integrity of the sources I have used. So pretty much in other words, this is what they have quoted and I am just going to be sharing those direct sentiments with you. So another term that is also often used when speaking about these children is the word chua, which in the masculine means rat and chui, which in the feminine means mouse. So these names further served to reinforce their reduction to animal status with the loss of human dignity, rights, 
and respect. Secondly, I just would like to mention that I mean absolutely no disrespect to any religions, any deities or any saints that I have mentioned. I researched these backgrounds quite thoroughly, but if there's something that I missed or misinterpreted, please do let me know in the comment section below. I'm always open to learning. So the place is Pakistan and the setting is the shrine of the great saint Shah Dola. And this space is revered as a sacred and spiritual space where people travel from across the country to visit. So to understand the children, we need to understand the story behind the legend of Shadola. So Shadola was always known to be incredibly close to Allah. So he worked as a mason in the city of Gujarat and as per tradition all masons had their own pupils. But one of his pupils had a small head and some learning disabilities and for this reason his family had given him to Shadola. So the boy had apparently served him well and followed him everywhere. So after seeing the reaction that he had gotten from this young boy, he then allegedly used to start putting iron caps on children and bringing them to the shrine so that they could sit and beg for him. So this earned him a great deal of money and the children became known as Shal Dola Shuri. According to the legend, which dated back hundreds of years, a woman who was struggling to conceive or who was infertile could become fertile by offering her prayers at the shrine. There was a slight catch though and this was that the first child that was then conceived needed to be offered up to the shrine. So fast forward to the 20th and early 21st century where there is now a larger than expected presence of children with characteristics of my so these children are seen to be close to god and thus if they are turned into beggars they can be utilized to bring in a lot of income for the syndicates who control them it is believed that these children can fulfill wishes but it is also believed that they can punish this is known as bad deo which is roughly translated to calling a curse to inflict evil so people therefore want to get their blessings and they want good luck and success in their lives so they then give clothing or money to these children so who are these children you may ask well these so-called rats of shal dollar were named as such for their physical appearance for their smaller heads and the relation of their eyes and their noses on their face. The smaller head is the main defining factor and it is actually a characteristic of a condition known as microcephaly. So microcephaly as a condition is actually quite rare, occurring anywhere between 1 in 10,000 births to 1 in 250,000 births globally. So for those of you who may not know, let me quickly explain microcephaly. Microcephaly is a condition in which a baby's head is significantly smaller than expected. Microcephaly can occur because a baby's brain has not developed completely or has stopped growing after birth, which can result in a smaller head size. Microcephaly can be an isolated condition. This is to say that it can occur without any other major birth defects or it can occur in a combination with other major birth defects. Microcephaly has been linked to the following problems. Seizures, developmental delays such as problems with speech or with other developmental milestones such as sitting, standing and walking intellectual disability, a decreased ability to learn and function in daily life, problems with moving and balance, feeding problems such as difficulty swallowing, hearing loss and vision problems. So these problems can range from mild to severe and are often lifelong. So some groups claim that these children are all suffering from a genetic disease. But this claim has been disputed by many, including a local Pakistani medical practitioner, Dr. Uman Khan, who said that the cases of microcephaly per birth ratio 
are incredibly low. So this leads us to the rumors of the inhumane practice that involves the placement of a steel ring around the head of the child in early years of development. So I even came across a journal article from 1960 which described it as the brain being willfully arrested by making the child wear a rigid metallic cap. So these rumors are so well known and they date back so many years that it's kind of hard to dispute that there might be some truth to this seemingly far-fetched story. Although not ever officially confirmed, there have been many stories that the locals have shared regarding these medieval torture methods. And whilst I was doing some research, I came across an online forum where a ton of individuals attested to specific details regarding the rat children of Pakistan. So in addition, there are journal studies and articles that date from 1879 which detail the legend that heads were purposefully deshaped during infancy using a clay covering. So between 1904 and 1909 there were also the first mentions of mothers purposefully deforming their infant's head for sacrifice at the shrine as well as deformation for financial gain also appearing. So in the late 90s, the BBC looked a little bit closer into the case of the rat children of Pakistan. So apparently, according to their research, criminal syndicates existed which served to drug and transport these children to different places like Gujarat, Jhelum and Rawapindi. So essentially, they are left to beg all day and then in the evening they are taken back to the home. So this is actually an incredibly profitable business for the so-called custodians of these children. So there were even rumors from human rights organizations and locals that these children would also be hired out on monthly contracts by mafia members. So on a good day they could earn as much as 2,000 rupees which today is the equivalent of 377 rand and 81 cents. And this was an incredible amount of money for a beggar to earn, especially in the 90s. So in 1998, their market value was around 90,000 rupees, which is the equivalent to about 17,000 rand. And yes, they really did calculate market value on them as though there were objects for sale. But they aren't objects, they're children. They had feelings, emotions, their own personalities and their own narrative, although many of them could not speak full sentences. So in much of the research that I did, one girl in particular kept showing up and her name is Nadia. Nadia was apparently left at the shrine as a baby and no one ever had any knowledge of her real family. She was therefore raised by the shrine and its caretakers. So it was known that she didn't speak very much and she would occasionally just point at whatever she needed and she would let out wails of laughter every now and then. She would also just shriek and if anyone tried to approach her, she would scream and swear. She was 25 years old and that was the only life she would ever know. So there's always two sides to every story. So what about the opposing views? So the caretakers of both these children and the shrine have always been adamant that they have never artificially created these children, but rather they found these children dumped at the shrine and they just took them in and looked after them. So others believe that these children were born out of inbreeding or cousin marriages. So the theory of artificial deformation in order to render a child physically disabled and mentally challenged in order for them to beg for a living to provide a lucrative trade was established and researched by one of Pakistan's top scientists. He, however, was banned from speaking on this issue altogether following media exposure in the late 90s. 
So, it's also believed that the Pakistani government kept the shrine going for so long because they were getting a cut out of it. Hmm. Corruption in the government. Does that sound familiar, my fellow South Africans? <laughs> So, the Shah Dollar Shrine is now controlled by the government of Pakistan and they stopped officially accepting microcephalax in the 1960s. So, in 2013, they went on to state that they had put measures in place to drastically reduce the number of criminal gangs in the area. However, not once did they ever acknowledge the narrative that human rights activists and scientists had put forward. So, outside of Pakistan, the Foundation for Children with Microcephaly is constantly fighting to raise awareness. They also made the announcement that September 30th would be National Microcephaly Day. So, at the end of the day, who is to blame? Well, firstly, the parents. Through misinformation and seemingly uneducated beliefs, they are abandoning their children at the shrine where these children are later subjected to heinous treatment. So this is also illegal and according to the Pakistani Penal Code, the PPC, Section 32B, it is in fact a criminal offence for a parent or person taking care of a child under the age of 12 years old to expose and abandon it. Secondly, the so-called caretakers of the children. Section 332 of the same code makes causing hurt by impairing, disabling, disfiguring, defacing, or dismembering anyone a crime. So exploitation of circumstantial situations, as well as putting the rats of Shaudala into begging in order to raise an income for the shrine, is further considered to be child labor. And hence, it is seen as a criminal offense under section 374 of the PPC as unlawful compulsory behavior. Furthermore, sending children out to beg is a direct violation under Section 36 of the Punjab Destitute and Neglected Children Act of 2004. And the last entity that I feel has responsibility in this is the government. And this is because they failed to act upon this great injustice sooner. So whether caused naturally or artificially, the exploitation of this vulnerable population of children with microcephaly was largely ignored for years and years. And when there were individuals speaking out, they were silenced. And so we have reached the Bella bottom line. So regardless of the situation, the fact remains that these children have been abused, neglected, exploited and treated as objects in order to bring income to their owners. It is shocking to think that this has been going on for a rumoured 200 years with the first written record of these occurrences dating back to the early to mid 1800s. So I just want to take a moment to say thank you so much for sticking in this episode with me and thank you for supporting my channel. I know this episode was a little bit outside of the realm of what I have been doing, but I uh, would love to know if you enjoyed it, if you found it interesting, enlightening, and if you'd like me to include more variety within my Makeup and Mayhem series. I'd like to end this episode with a quote that I have always resonated with and one that I feel is incredibly fitting for this episode. The quote also happens to be from an incredibly famous South African man, Nelson Mandela. There can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. And so my loves, that is it from me. I will catch you next week. Same place, same face, kind of. <laughs> so until next time, my loves, stay safe, stay awesome, and stay blessed. Bye.